everyone, my name is Sarah Schickman. I'm a managing partner here at Lingia Law. And this video is about how to start a medical spa in North Carolina. And joining me here today is Mallory, one of my associates, and she's licensed both in North Carolina and Tennessee. And she's based in North Carolina. And so she's gonna go over how to start a med spa in North Carolina, some of the pitfalls to avoid, and some of the legal things to consider when you're starting. So Mallory, welcome. and. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, thank you, Sarah, for the introduction and hello to all of our viewers. Um, my name is Mallory Farrar and I have been practicing in the healthcare space throughout my career. I really became attracted to the medical spa space because I think that it is an industry where people are made to feel better about themselves. And when people feel their best, they are their best. Yeah, it's really a unique industry and it's been fantastic supporting so many people starting businesses in it and many of them women. So it's it's awesome. Um, so let's just jump right into it. So in North Carolina, what's a medical spa and what makes somebody's business a medical spa? North Carolina law does not precisely define the term medical spa. So the way that we typically look at this is by looking at the services being provided. When those services rise to the level of what would be considered the practice of medicine, that's when your spa becomes a medical spa. Got it. So using a very popular service that we talk about, like Botox, for example, would that be considered a medical service? In North Carolina, no. Typically in North Carolina, um, people are able, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses are permitted to perform injections provided that it's within their scope of practice and they are properly supervised. Got it. Okay, perfect. And is North Carolina one of the states that prohibits the corporate practice of medicine? And what is that? Oh, yes, very much so. Um, the corporate practice of medicine doctrine, which is in many states, not just North Carolina, essentially prohibits a person who is not a licensed healthcare provider from owning a business that provides medical services. The intent behind this is to be sure that financial incentives don't sway good clinical judgment. That does make it a problem, however, for people who aren't licensed but want to be in the business. Got it. Um, so let's say somebody is a registered nurse. Could they own or be involved in a medical business in North Carolina? If they are a registered nurse, they can only be employed by a, a, a medical entity. In North Carolina, only physicians or physicians in combination with physician assistants or physicians in combination with nurse practitioners may be shareholders of a medical professional corporation. So how does the whole MSO thing fit in? Like what's an MSO and how do registered nurses form M MSOs? Great. Um, MSOs are management services organizations, and what they typically do is provide business and administrative services to medical practices. That would be things like billing and collecting, um, assisting with negotiating, you know, vendor contracts, those types of things. So when we have someone who is not licensed at the level that North Carolina requires, so physician or a physician working with a PA or an MP, what we do is we assist that individual in forming a management services organization. That management services organization contracts with a medical practice that is owned by a licensee that's permitted to do so. And that person also typically ends up serving as the medical director. So the, the, the MSO contracts with the practice to provide those business and administrative services in exchange for a monthly management fee. What it looks like on the back end is that the management services organization holds the bulk of the assets of the company, not the clinical assets, but the amount of control that you would need to make the business decisions. So that is our way of giving um, non-licensed individuals the ability to control and steer the business without running afoul of the corporate practice of medicine. Very clever. Um, so in these medical spa settings, like what type of licensure is needed for the different staff? Like what what determines that and what what does it have to be? 
Right. Um, so it's pretty procedure specific, like we touched on earlier. Um, for the most part in North Carolina, licensed practical nurses and registered nurses are permitted to do a, a fairly broad array of procedures based on their scope of practice and their supervision by that physician. Um, however, for certain things like firing a laser, you've got to be an MD or, or a, a DO. But for things like performing injectables, it's okay to have an LPN or an RN do that kind of work. So it's really specific to the procedure. And these definitions and the way the laws are built around them are subject to change frequently. So staying on top of that concept is really critical to understanding the limitations or the freedoms of your business. Got it. And so once we set up this MSL structure for someone and they have a medical director and all that stuff is in place, is that enough? Or are there other documents that people need to have in their practice to be compliant? That is not enough. <laughs> um, we always recommend with any business that people are sure they have a well-rounded compliance program. And that's going to encompass everything between, you know, staying within the law, having that correct licensure, making sure people are being supervised. But outside of that more clinical scope, you need to be sure that you have policies and procedures addressing all of the things that are going to be happening inside your space. And that includes things like standard operating procedures, protocols, uh, patient consent forms, all of those types of things you typically see in a medical practice, but envision that being in, in your business. Got it. And then in terms of advertising, can people just advertise anything they want in medical and say whatever they want, or is it pretty regulated and should it be checked by a lawyer? Thank goodness they cannot just say whatever they want. <laughs> um, so advertising laws are tricky. And when you are performing medical procedures, they become a lot trickier. So a lot of states like North Carolina prohibit you. The, the main point we want people to consider is that anything you say on your site has to be objectively verifiable. So you can't say things like, you know, our nurse injectors are the best in the world and will make you look exactly how you wanna look because we can't verify that. But you can say our nurse injectors are properly trained and certified and are, you know, more than happy to help our clients achieve the best results possible. Because that is something that you can verify training, you can verify certification, and you can arguably, by the purpose of your business, verify that your goal is to help the client achieve what they're looking for. Definitely, yeah. And I think sometimes in the advertising, we want to say more, or we want to help our clients say more, but it's always important to be very precise. Like when people say something is FDA approved, and it's actually not FDA approved for that specific use people could get into a lot of trouble. Right. And I think it's also important for people to remember that as the medical spa owner, you are a walking advertisement. So it's important to remind yourself that that, that face of you needs to be on at all times when you're in situations where you might be networking or building your client base. So it goes beyond what your website says. It also affects what you say and how, how you, you know, put the business out there. That's a really good point. So then when it comes to vendor contracts, for example, when people are buying like lasers or, or other devices, are there things that people should look out for or should people just sign those contracts and not have their lawyers look at them? Well, I have to start by saying anytime you're buying something expensive, look at the contract, please. <laughs> but um, of course, that's what we're here to help with. Definitely in this space, <clears throat> things can be a bit dicey when you're, you know, going through purchase agreements. So for example, purchasing a used laser from a vendor that you can't really vet or that you haven't heard of before might really come back to get you in the end when six months later that laser stops working and the vendor you purchased it from says, well, sorry, there's a 30 day, you know, policy to return the laser. We all know that's not very fair. So it, it's kind of those techniques you wanna look out for. And with respect to things like ordering your injectables and other devices and drugs that go along with your programs, you need to be very careful that you're 
vetting the people you're getting those things from. So that means, you know, making sure that you're not seeing things on Google about how they've been in trouble for things. That means talking to your colleagues <clears throat> about what their experience with different vendors have been. But the bottom line is from point A to the point where it gets to the patient, you need to make sure that you can back up that chain of distribution to the extent that you possibly can. So it's just really important to be considerate and very strategic about how you enter into contracts with vendors. Yeah, definitely. And we as a firm have dealt with a lot of different vendor contracts, both helping people sign them and then helping people get out of them. So if people have any questions about them, just send them to us first and we're happy to take a look for sure. Um, what about other sources of liability? What, in general, is it risky to start a medical spa in North Carolina? And like, how can owners mitigate some of that risk? Right. Um, I mean, anytime you're providing anything that we could put in the category of healthcare, your risks are increased. Um, because, you know, there's, there's just so much more to it when the service you're providing and the product that results is that patient. So one thing to be very aware of is that you have to think like, like you're running a medical practice, even if you're performing a lower amount of um, services for somebody. So that is one way to always kind of be thinking and how can I avoid risk and liability? Other than that, it's just great to have a really good compliance program. It's great to be sure that you are staying on top of the laws and regulations because they change frequently. And in this particular space, they're changing very frequently. Um, so you, you really just need to stay abreast of what's going on in the industry and really keep tabs on your colleagues and also other businesses around you and make sure that you are that you are following what you believe to be the best course, but that you're not seeing great differences in the way you operate versus how they operate. It may be a matter of they're just not doing it right and you are, but it could be a matter of the opposite. So it's really, you've got to take a holistic approach to identifying risks and avoiding those liabilities that can come with them. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you. So then with the boards in North Carolina, have we seen more enforcement recently or has it been pretty quiet? I mean, I know the answer because we've worked on a lot of these matters together, but I want to hear <laughs> from you firsthand. Enforcement is ramping up um, considerably right now. And there has been a lot of focus on the medical spa space because, again, it does kind of walk that line between what is not the practice of medicine and what is. And, and that also applies to, you know, the boards of nursing have oversight over every nurse providing those services, just like the boards of medicine have oversight over the physician who is supervising or owning the practice. So it's important to keep in mind that those regulators are always looking out for something, but they care more about the big things. So that's like the corporate practice of medicine, whether there is appropriate supervision happening in a relationship between a physician and, for example, an RN. Those are the kinds of things that the board will pay attention to and is likely to enforce. Got it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. This is this is great. I think that yeah. you gave our um, viewers a lot of good information and um, people could always reach out to us on our website, which is lingialaw.com and schedule a free consultation. And uh, this is what we do. And this is what we love doing. And we'd love to help you start your med spa or make your med spa compliant. So reach out to us and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Bye.